my friend. I, re I really hate those introductions because, like, where do you go from there? I would have rather you said, here's an idiot, and I could just prove you wrong. Uh, thank you for being here again. Thank you for your time and, and your uh, engagement and being so uh, warm and welcoming to me. It's an honor to be here with uh, esteemed faith leaders from so many traditions, and we're going to talk about the bigger table um, how many people, if you would just raise your hand, if you were here yesterday, just put up your hand. Okay, so what they've asked me to do is share some of my story, which I did yesterday. So the, those of you who raised your hand, act surprised when I say what I'm about to say. So really quickly, I want to let you know that, you know, I have been a pastor in the local church for 25 years. That was not at all the plan, but part of the joy of living is realizing that there are things better than your plan, Right. And for me, it was growing up in the, a bubble in Syracuse, New York. Well, it was a snow globe, really, right? But I grew up very sheltered, very um, segregated from diversity. I was told a story about the world. I was told that, that I was made in the image of God and that theoretically everyone was made in the image of God, but I was made a little bit more in the image of God because I got false stories about people of color, and I got false stories about Muslims, and I got false stories about gay people, right? And in all those false stories that I inherited, something told me that I was just a little bit more deserving of the love of this great big God than they were. And for me, I talked yesterday about getting to, going to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is, there's my brother there. He's the, you, had, you had your hand up yesterday, right? So yeah, when I said God gave me the gift of Philadelphia, and this was the only soul in the room who understood what I was saying, but for me, what Philadelphia did was it gave me an image of the world that was far more expansive than the one that I had been raised in. It was as if the doors opened up and I saw, no, this is actually what disparate community looks like. I was around diversity like I'd never experienced, and I was around poverty that I had never seen. But here's the thing, friends, I experienced diversity and poverty not as intellectual exercises, not as theological debates, not as political arguments, but as flesh and blood human beings with names and faces and stories. And those stories started to change me. And I became a, a pastor 10 years later, and for me it was a rude awakening to realize that I could not be a person of the bigger table as a pastor because the church started to gradually shrink my table. And I was only around people from my church who looked like me and talked like me and believed like me. And for me, I started to realize that I, an authentic voice was a liability for me as a minister. I knew that if I started to speak uh, on equality and diversity and justice, that there were going to be people in my congregation who were going to find that to be confrontational. And it was up to me to decide how I wanted to deal with those things. And I can remember the first place in my community that I realized we were a small table church is that LGBTQ teenagers were not welcome in our church. And I decided that if I was going to be a person at the bigger table, if I was going to embrace the expansive, compassionate heart of Jesus, I was going to let them know that they were seen and heard and loved and respected. And so I started to be more explicit in the words that I used, and something started to happen. Teenagers in our youth group began to come out, one or two, and then many. And I got called to the pastor's office. I thought it was to celebrate something, and it turns out it was the principal's office that I was really visiting because the pastor said, John, you know, I've noticed that there are a lot of gay people in our youth group. And I said, uh, Pastor, we don't have more per capita homosexuals. I said, they just know that they can be themselves and they're loved as they are. And something happens when you know that you're loved as you are, you can exhale, right? But I realized it was a problem for my pastor that we had diversity in our youth group. So I knew that I was going to either have to avoid that or lean into it. And as I told you yesterday, I decided to lean into it. I decided to ask every question. I decided to preach every doubt. I decided to ask why the church is so toxic to so many. 
And I told you that I started at a new church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and just five months into my time there, I heard God calling me to leave that church. Came in the form of my pastor's voice saying, you're fired, <laughs> right? I, I was given the, I, I, the spiritual gift of being released, is what they call it in the church, when you're canned, right? But I realized in that place, I was no longer beholden to a job or to a role or to expectation. I didn't have to represent anyone else's faith tradition but my own. And I began to ask everything and say anything. And I decided to let people know that they were inherently beautiful and loved as they are without exception. And so that road has sort of led me to where I am, to being a pastor of the bigger table, seeking communities of the bigger table. And you are all here, which means you are the people of the bigger table. Now, really quick, I want to tell you a story to set up what we're going to talk about tonight and the problem. So my family, we decided to go to Universal Studios in Florida. We had traveled. We drove to the airport. We took two flights. We got to uh, the airport. We've got to take a tram. We get to the bus. We get to the hotel. We take another bus. We finally get to Universal Studios, and we're all excited exhausted and they say what do you want to do first and my two kids say we're going to do the shrek 4d experience now that's like a 3d movie right but then they spray you with air and water and your chair moves they give you this really immersive thing but the heart of the experience is this beautiful 3d movie so we go into there i'm really excited they give us our plastic 3d glasses i kind of place mine around my neck and we get our seats and we sit down and the house lights go down, and on screen it says, put on your 3D glasses. So I put on my 3D glasses, and we're all excited, and the film starts. We're finally here in Disney, or in Orlando, and I'm looking at this film, and I'm not impressed. It's like not as clear as I thought it would be. It was not as vibrant as I thought it would be. And so I'm really disappointed, and I'm watching this, and I look to my left because I know my wife, she will mirror my disgust at the world, right? And she seems fine. And I'm thinking, well, she married me, so who can account for her taste, right? And I look around at everyone else, because obviously there's something wrong with the screen. Everyone else is having a good time. I'm like, well, their standards are low, right? So I sit through this film begrudgingly for nine minutes. It finishes. The house lights come up. I turn to my wife, and she looks at me, and she said, what's that? I said, what? She said, right there. And I looked down, and I said, what did I? I had pulled my sunglasses onto my head, and I watched the entire 3D movie with ordinary sunglasses. So my wife is long-suffering, so she said, let's go around. And we got in line again. We did the whole thing over. I sit down. I put on the 3D glasses this time, and you know what? It was great. It was so vibrant and beautiful. But the lenses through which we view the world matters, Right? And what I want you to do is realize something before we begin tonight. We have different representatives from faith traditions. I realize that I have a problem trying to be a person of the bigger table. It's a challenge that I have, but it's one that Rabbi Mark has and everyone in this front row has and all you guys back there have, is that we all make God partially or substantially in our own image. Right? We all have lenses through which we view the world and we have an idea of that word God. That word God for us is created by the places in which we are raised and the people who spoke into our lives and our religious tradition or whether we are part of a faith community or not. And all the things that have happened to us have shaped the image of God that we have in our heads. And the problem there is we have to somehow communicate to one another what God looks like and then we have a bigger problem. We get together in community and we have to decide how are we going to represent the character of God in the world. So what I love about the bigger table is that there's an adventure there, but there's also difficulty, isn't there? Because we have to sit there with our, there is many, if we're honest, there are many gods in this room as there are people. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to share our stories and we're going to try to find what is the common character of God that we can all embrace together and show to the world. Because the biggest problem with religion right now is people have a God that is far too small to actually be God. In my Christian tradition, you know the voices of hatred and bigotry and misogyny and nationalism. 
And those people have a God that they believe dearly in, but that God, it resembles them. That God has all their fears and all their prejudices and all their worries and their hang-ups. And so what we're going to try to do is pursue a God that is far larger than we are. Um, really interesting. I, um, I have a friend, and she, her name is Sally. She's in her late 60s. She's much wiser than I am and much uh, kinder. Because what she decided was, after the election, she saw the brokenness in our country. And she said, what I'm going to do as a person of faith, I'm going to sit with people who are very different from me. So she said, I reached out through my friendships and through my family and through my social media. And I started to meet every Sunday with four or five people. We're going to play bridge and we're going to have lunch and I'm going to learn about their lives. Because I know they, they're almost diametrically opposed to me in many issues. So she meets with, in her case, support uh, hardcore uh, religious conservatives. Now you're thinking, Sally's awesome, and that sounds beautiful. But it isn't beautiful for Sally. Because every Saturday she calls me and she said, Oh, God, if you still pray, pray for me, because i got to go in with these people, and they're going to go into my house, and we're going to talk about immigration, or we're going to talk about health care, and it's going to get really ugly, and you have to give me the right words to say. But she said, sometimes I feel things improving and we, I see cracks in the facade and we begin to relate to one another. She said, we were talking about the, the racial divide in our country. And then she said, this woman, who is a white woman in her 60s, she said, the woman started to tear up. And my friend Sally said, what's going on? What's wrong? And she said, well, I just don't know why God made other races. So... I said, wow, what did you say? Because what I would have said was, well, if Adam and Eve existed, they weren't Caucasian. Like, I would have said, the, you know, the cradle of civilization didn't come with a cracker barrel. Like, I would have said those things. But she said, tell me more. And this woman, still crying, said, yeah, I just feel like if God hadn't made other races, then we'd all just get along. And did you hear the bias in that phrase? The woman considered herself the default of race and everyone else who was not white is other races. But what you also heard in there is a woman who is genuinely grieving the dysfunction in the world, but she, she's a good person with a bad story. And as we gather to talk about the bigger table, what we're going to talk about is good people with a bad story. That's why their table is small. They're not sinister. They're not knowingly being violent or hateful. They just have a different narrative in their heads. So I'm really grateful to be here with the people of the bigger table. And let's, uh, let's see if we can really expand what we, uh, what we think about life and God and faith. So, Rabbi? Reverend Najuma, Omar, Rabbi Feinstein, come on up. You all get the comfortable chairs. Yeah, nice chairs. Yeah, we gave you waters. Okay, so let's uh, um, let's start with. Um, With Reverend Najuma, listening to what John said, what is your conception or your definition, understanding of God, and how do you create a bigger table? Um, well, thank you for having me. Thank you, John, for your comments. Um, my conception of God is God is spirit and uh, present for all, in all, um, that God has no particular look, gender, race, nationality, but God just is, and God is even the breath that we're breathing right now, um, and that's how I understand God. Um, to your second question, which is, how do I make a bigger table? Um, coming up through years of going through homiletics and hermeneutics, um, one of my instructors, Dr. Monica Coleman, 
challenged us in this way. She said, the way to, the thing to always do when you approach the text, she calls it hermeneutical suspicion. And she said to look at who's missing from the text because the text is always written from a particular vantage point, uh, primarily male and privileged. But um, so she said the way to, to, the best way to approach a text so that way you preach properly or preach well so it's inclusive is to ask who's missing. So for me, I pattern my thought around when you talk about making a bigger table, it's always to ask the question, who's missing? So even when I look at this room, the question is who's not in the room? Who's missing from this conversation right now? Yeah. Okay. Rabbi, Rabbi Mark, real quick. Go That's ahead. such a wise way to look at faith community because in many faith communities, we're so used to who's already there and we're so focused on who's already there that it doesn't even occur to us to think about that, that um, omission you know, and I was uh, the church in Raleigh that I was a part of. We I always say we span the racial diversity from white to beige, yeah. <laughs> and then we had to realize like there's a whole other story that we're right. missing. So yeah. it's uh, beautiful. Awesome. Beautiful, thank you, Rabbi Feinstein. I don't remember. Whatever you want to answer. <laughs> oh, conception of God. Conception of God and and how you create a bigger table. Right. Well, however long okay, you want. Real quick, it's a verb. God is not a noun. God is a verb. A verb, a noun is something, a place, person, or a place or thing, right? You can touch it, point to it. A verb is something you do. It's something that's happening. God is a verb. For me, the fundamental question isn't a metaphysical question. Is there a God? Where is that God? What is the nature of divinity? I want to know what kind of human being your faith makes you. Are you Godding? And is the God that you're practicing, that you're living out, that you're doing in the world, making you bigger or small? Are you becoming a larger person, reaching beyond the boundaries of self to help and to heal and to give and to care and to teach and to feed and to, and to hold? Or is it always what I need, what I want? Is it based in fear, in the fear that someone's coming to take away what's mine? Godding, the verb that is God, is to reach beyond the self. And how, how do you make a bigger table at Valley Beth Shalom? Well, wherever you are, that's the qu question, is to reach beyond the self. And, and, to, re and to, to recognize the fear that, fo that forms the boundary of myself. All of us have a boundary of fear. Right? The, 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 the folks who are afraid to reach over that boundary and touch the person who's, who's, who's different than me and discover how much they're one with me. That's the great task of faith. In, in, in Jewish faith, <laughs> we have a weird faith. God has a name you can't say. <laughs> now go think about that for a minute, right? I mean, God carries an ID card that no one can read, right? Yeah, I just hope you don't get pulled over by the police. Um, because the idea is that you can't pin it down. You can't say it's mine, he's white, he's male, he's cisgender, he's straight, he's American, he speaks English, he lives in the valley, <laughs> uh, drives a Lexus, you know. But that, that, God is a lot e that God is a lot easier when you have that God. Yeah, that's the point, that the boundary of that God is my fear of reaching across my, my, the boundary of self and seeing that the other is mine. That the other's my problem, the other's my concern, the other's myself just reflected. And that's the great task of faith. The great task of faith is to push back fear. Thank you, Umar. Asalaamu As Alaikum. How y'all doing? Good. Um, in my heart and mind, God is one. And he has attributes that refer to this, his oneness. God is the creator. God is the sustainer, the most merciful, the most wise. That's how I got my last name, Hakeem. It's one of the attributes of God. I'm a servant of the most wise. Um, God is the source of peace and perfection. Because growing up in Compton, California, so my gift was Compton. Right. You know what I'm saying? So my gift was Compton. So growing up in Compton, California, I needed a source for peace and perfection. Perfection. 
not saying that I grew up way out there, but there were some things in my life that I needed correcting. I needed to rediscover uh, who I was coming out the birth canal. Um, God is this, uh, the biggest thing in my life. God is great. These attributes, I got more in my pocket, in my wallet, you know what I'm saying? But God is just the biggest thing in my life that is ever that I've ever discovered. And once I embrace his, the knowledge, his speech, it began to guide me into principles of five pillars to an intangible vision, to a, a vision that's so intangible that I want to reach it through five pillars. And um, I'm able to now come to bigger tables because of, my, because of the things that I've learned and how I want to get along with others, how I choose. And, and it's a choice that I've made that I would like to get along with others because I grew up thinking that there was no room at these tables for me. But through the navigation of life, you gain certain experiences um, to be a, a great follower and then a, hopefully to become a great leader. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is for all of you. I grew up in the 50s and 60s, so I'm old. Um, and we were blessed then. We, I'm not sure we even realized how blessed. I realize it now, when we were speaking before and that. We had faith leaders, Reverend King, Rabbi Heschel, so many others that made civil rights a faith issue, not a political issue. They changed the, the, the um, they had the amendments and, and the acts. They did the Civil Rights Act, et cetera. And it was clergy and la laity united against the Vietnam War that was a big push to get out of Vietnam. And we've lost that. There was all the divides that happened, black, white, Christian, uh, Jew, Muslim, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we live in the shadow of 9-11. Of I mean, you know, this is just this last um, Tuesday. Thir Wednesday, Wednesday, pardon me. So how do we, what do we need to do to who is the Martin Luther King Jr., who is the Abraham Joshua Eschel, who is, uh, um, who are the people, and without those people, what do we need to do in order for us to have this conversation, not just today, but to continue it, and then to make sure it happens all over the country, where faith leaders are coming together to really take on these issues that are moral and spiritual issues. They are not political. Um, I, I, I want to say this. I think um, I, I'm of the belief that things happen in, in their time for a reason. So a Dr. King and a Rabbi Heschel were necessary at that time. I don't think that we're in an era where we need one or two voices. Okay. I really do believe um, when we look at ourselves, that Dr. King is in the room, Rabbi Herschel's in the room, and other leaders, all the other leaders, right? That there's a Fannie Lou Hamer in this room. And I think what we have to get away from is waiting for a voice to arise. Because then that allows us to be lazy mm -hmm. about the things that are necessary to take care of. The, the truth is, if all of us decided every day to wake up and say, what can I do to make a difference, and not wait on a voice, then, then things actually, the movement that, that God, who's a verb, the movement of God happens. And I think we, we have to come away from waiting on King to come back in another person. It's not going to happen. 
Right. So what do we need to do? I think all of us in this room need to decide tomorrow morning when I get up to ask the question of their God, what do I need to do to make a difference? Whether it's making one thing or making a big thing, it doesn't matter. But taking on the taking using our faith individually first, starting there and then, uh, you know, partnering with people and growing from that place. But but stop waiting. Stop waiting for a voice. Stop waiting for permission. None of us need permission in here to do the right thing. None of us need permission to feed a homeless person. None of us need permission to call the county jail and say, what can I do? We don't need permission. You don't need, just in case you were wondering, if you're waiting on a sign, this is your sign. You don't need permission. You can actually get started as soon as we leave here. But (laughs) you're welcome. (laughs) But I think that's, you know, we keep asking that question, like, where's the, who's the next king? I don't, I don't think that's going to happen again. I think King Heschel and others were necessary for a time and for an era that was necessary. But we're in a new, we're in a different kind of day. And too many faith leaders, and everyone in here is a faith leader, no matter what their tradition is, that you are the faith leader that your world is looking for. You're the it. I'm it. We're it. And it ain't coming from someplace else. We're it. And that we take that responsibility and move in that, in that, in that space. And collectively, if all of us collectively move, the collective power really becomes visible. Yeah, I, I think, Rabbi Mark, that, that's exactly true. I think um, the difference for us now is we have to figure out how to create a network of like-hearted people. So, you know, they have social media here, right, in this area of the country, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you know, you all have theoretically something that we never had that never existed in the 60s or 70s or 80s. You have access to thousands of people, and you can let them hear whatever message you want them to hear until they unfriend you like they do with me. But you can say, what, what am I, how am I leveraging that so that I can not only speak words I think need to be spoken, but connect with other people where I am geographically and saying, what can we actually do to alter the space in which we live? So theoretically, tonight, you all live within a driving distance. Many of you live on this site. So you could actually be saying to get together and say, what movement would we like to create in this country right now? And you are capable of it. Yeah. There, was, there was a commercial. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump. I think no, you're going to say something, Dr. Umar, Brother Umar. There was a commercial that went out some time ago, maybe it was last year before, where it had like all these images of people, and they were all saying, I am Dr. King. So let's practice that. I want, because I want to empower you. One, two, three. I want you to say, I am Dr. King. Are you ready? One, two, three. I am Dr. King. You don't need to wait. He's not coming back in somebody else's form. You're it. You're it. Come on. In that process of trying to find out where you belong, I really think that we need to identify our purpose individually. Because you could come to the table, but if you don't, if, but, but if you haven't ID your purpose at the table, you may get lost in the other brands that's participating in that conversation. So we all wear these t-shirts with different brands, and, and but we get lost in just doing it or, the, or, or, or me and Courage. We get lost in that. But who are you individually? Where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? Who do you want to get there with? As they both said, identify with like-minded people. This is very necessary. Because um, on this path, I'm reading Napoleon Hill right now. (laughs) And Napoleon Hill says, you know, the more you you auto-suggest to your subconscious, there you go, sir. There you go. Uh, the more you s- auto-suggest to your, to your conscious, your subconscious is going to pick it up. And it's, gonna, and it's going to, you're going to um, put out those actions. So whatever you constantly tell yourself. And then the cold thing about the mind, if you feed it something positive, it's going to go positive. If you feed it something negative, it's going to grow negative. Amen. So we have to identify... We, the pronoun for us, we have to identify what we're going to feed ourselves on a daily basis. Is it going to be Carl's Jr.? Is it going to be Krispy Kreme? Or is it going to be a vegan option or, 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 or a pescatarian option? Halal, you know, whatever 
kosher, whatever you feed yourself is definitely going to come out through your limbs and your speech and your actions. So for me, in my mind, before coming to that table, identify your purpose. Because it may be art, it may be hip-hop, it may be spoken word, it may be... Um, and, 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 and each one could translate into so many different avenues. Thank you. Actually, I want to evade the question for just a moment. You invade the yeah, question. I Amazing. Ask, I want to ask, ask John a question. because you're. Again, I want to evade the answer. No, thing. no, no. Listen. <laughs> so everyone, every tradition has its, its smallness. Yeah. They all have their chauvinism, their small-hearted, hard-heartedness. Um, but because Christianity, particularly evangelical Christianity, is so big in America and has so much media attention, it gets a lot of cultural attention. So I want to just ask you to help us understand something, because I know you've written a lot about this. Why, why is there so much smallness in that world? Political, cultural, moral, spiritual smallness in that world. <laughs> well, I think... I offer that without, without, without offense, I hope. No, I no none taken. Um, I think fear is the greatest tool that religion has when it wants to do the wrong thing. And so the fear, if I can get someone to believe that they are constantly under attack or constantly in danger of a person with brown skin or someone from outside America or someone who has a different um, orientation than them, I can weaponize that fear. And so I think what you see in, in religion right now in Christianity is you see people who have taken all the fears of people and said, I'm going to put that out there every day until they are so terrified that I tell them, and I'll keep you safe, and here's how I'll do it. And so I'm always telling people, if you're in this room and you're a person who's a Christian and you find that to be a complete disconnect with the heart of Jesus like I do, then you need to say that because right now... Christianity has relinquished the conversation to the people who are the most angry and the most bigoted and people who wouldn't really recognize a biblical Jesus. They would actually kick him out. Um, so, yeah, the, it's just a complete idea of I want to terrify you and here's how I'll do it. I'll use God. And often I get people and I say like that woman, my friend Sally's friend, she's a good person but with a bad story. If you think God is always out to squash you, you're going to do whatever that God tells you so that that God doesn't squash you. Thank you. And, and I think that, you know, going along with all this, I think that one of the things that happens and, and what we need to do, we need to, because I had Mark Whitlock at, at – uh, Young Kippur services, a couple of years. And, and he, the first year he came, people said, why are you having him? And I had Father Greg Boyle, why are you having him? And I said, because they're great spiritual leaders. So I think that, that one thing is that all of our communities would ask that same question. When we ask somebody from outside to come. So how can we, how can we do more to bring more Johns, more Umars, more Eds, more Najumas to the different communities? How do we share it? I remember, I think Rabbi Showai shared a, um, didn't he go to a, a church one time? More than one. I mean, but I mean, spoke, spoke at a church and had a, had a minister or a priest come speak at, at Valley Beth Shalom. Right. How do we get more back? How do we get back into that and do more of that? Because John coming here gave everybody here a different idea of what a Christian is. And, and I have to tell you, okay, growing up when I grew up, Christians were not kind to Jews. There's Jewish country clubs because Christians wouldn't let Jews in. And then, of course, the Jews did the same thing, not letting people in. I mean, you, you know, it's, yeah. it, 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 it's this constant. Well, I think, too, you know, I said yesterday that my goal is to be an expectation-defined Christian. I think everyone on this panel would say, I'm here to be an expectation-defined version of my tradition because I know what a stereotype of my tradition is. And I think that's the beauty of it. And the more we can tell people, no, this is the reality of people of faith. It's not, this is the middle of people, you know, largely this is a represent, we represent a middle who say, we know we have differences, but we love one another through them, and the conversation is going to happen. So, 
Um, one of the hats that I wear, I'm, a, I'm the president for LA Voice, so I'm a community organizer. One of my first assignments, I came, on, I came into LA Voice as, a, uh, as an organizer, they trained me. So Zach Hoover gave me an assignment to, um, to do 20 one-to-ones a week. So I had to meet with 20 different individuals every, every week between Monday and Monday. So I had, I did it on the bus, I did it on the train, and I did these one to one I didn't have a car. So I did these one to ones on the bus, the train, the train station in my neighborhood. I talked to Google, I talked to everybody. Google was a home in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, I, talk, I spoke with everybody. But then when I got to my community, the Muslim community, I, my first campaign was getting past the salams. Because you know, we greet each other with assalamu alaikum, alaikum assalam. But then that's where the conversation ended at. So my, my point of that campaign was, do we know each other outside of the salams? So do you know each other outside of the salams, outside of, the, outside of uh, saying hi? Have you investigated or researched or inquired about this person's well-being? How's their family? How can I help you today within my capacity? So coming to this larger, what can we do? How well do we know the other person? Because when you get to know the other person, hopefully you identify common interests, a common ground to that you, now you can have a bigger dialogue. Yeah, that, you know, I shared yesterday, Umar, that, you know, getting truer stories about people was the thing that altered my theology. And when you get proximity to people, I think proximity is the most sacred thing that we can do because then we are invested in their lives. And most people, that's what we see in faith communities. People will sit next to one another every day, every week for years and not really be invested in the people around them. So that's a huge part of this. And, and I would offer, to to what they've shared is, um, courage and intention. Um, even if wake you're up and win. Huh? Tell, them, tell them about wake up and win. <laughs> I'll tell about that later. Um, but courage and intention. And even and one of the things that we did, we um, we created a, a partnership between my church, Word of Encouragement, Temple Aliyah, and um, and Greater Zion in Compton. And uh, Rabbi, the Rabbi and the Cantor, Pastor Fisher, and myself, we all got together for lunch over a period of time. And then we brought our congregations together and we shared meals. Um, and to your point about proximity, we got to know each other. We made people intentionally sit together and ask questions, but that took courage on our part as leaders. And so, to, and, and we did it, you know, because we're faith leaders, we're pastors, clergy leaders. But I, I would offer to all of, to everyone in this room that to, to do this work, it takes courage because sometimes you don't know people. Sometimes you just don't know. You don't know how people are going to come off. You don't know if they're going to accept you. You don't want to say anything stupid. What if they say something offensive to you? And so it takes courage. But be courageous, right? Just be courageous and, and be honest. Even if you're not sure about the other person, it's better to say, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I want to know you. I want to understand and if I say something stupid, charge it to my ignorance and then correct me on it. But, but have the courage to let people correct you and vice versa. And so I think, and then be intentional in that, you know, the one-on-ones are intentional. But, but all of us can do this. You can do it in the market. You can do it at Starbucks. I mean, but we got to have the courage to reach out beyond ourselves and just say, hey, who are you? Like, if I saw you in Starbucks, I'd be like, yo, what's up? <laughs> like, like, I, what's your story, man? I don't know who you are, but what's your story? Tell me about yeah. them shoes. Tell me about them shoes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like, and so it, it doesn't have to be spooky, guys. It doesn't have to be weird. And, you know, for me right now, the pink hair has been a real conversational starter. I mean, I get all kind of people coming. I get people in their cars honking, beep, beep, my hair is cool. Thanks. You know, uh, <laughs> see, see, cur courage. See? So I it's do, about. I do like the hair. Thank you. I appreciate it. I want to offer a counterintuitive idea, a completely oh. opposite <laughs> idea. The boundaries, the walls that we build among each other, between us, are built out of fear. And the only way to jump over or pass through or break down a wall of fear is to have a home, is to know that I belong somewhere, is to be 
to be, and there's a place in the world where I'm accepted, where I belong, where I know I am. And because I know I am, and I know I'm welcomed in that place, I have the courage to break through that wall and accept and, and find you and accept you. And part of the reason why the walls are so big and the, they're charged with so much electric fear is because there's so many spiritually homeless people in the world who are terrified. They're just terrified because they don't know where they belong. It seems to me the scripture says you'll love the other like you love yourself. So you've got to start with some self-love, which means you've got to start from a place of home. When I read John's books, I've been reading John's books all week. I've been living with John Pavlowitz all week. I mean, he's, it's, he's, my wife thinks I'm having an affair. You know, yeah, it's my, my wife is like, good, you live with him. No, it's great. And, and, and I'll tell you what I found in your book, John. You live in your Christian faith. You wear it so comfortably. It, comes, it came from your mom and dad's table. It came from your family. It came from that moment your brother came out. You, you found that you, you wear that faith. And when you had to confront the wall of fear, the wall that separates that pastor who released you, you know, and, and, and all the tension and finding your authenticity, you did it from a place of power because you did it because Jesus lives with you, because Christ lives with you, because Scripture lives in you and, you, and you come at it from a place of home. So the first task is to make you feel at home somewhere. And once you have that sense of home, then you go out and touch that wall and not be afraid of what happens to you when you touch that wall of fear. Well, and I think that's what I don't want to speak for everyone in this room, but I bet many of you have experienced that sense of home here. And that's why it's you're not being converted into something. You're actually just being shown the character of God. And then you say, OK, that's I, I've experienced it now. I can go out and live it. So I think that sense of home is so powerful. You're right. Um, also, once you establish or ground yourself. Um, for me, I identified a verse in the Quran that says, establish weight with justice and fall not short in the balance. That gives me my purpose. But now, I have to make sure that I don't let you, you, or you intimidate my purpose. I have to walk into a room, because I was really, because even coming here to a Jewish-based community, I have certain reservations on what I can say, what I can't say, who's going to be there, who's not going to be there. But I cannot let that stand in my way of fulfilling my establishing weight with justice and falling not short in the balance. So as we were saying earlier, Rabbi, these other platforms that exist of hate, whether it's political, social, Facebook, the cancel culture, those are all tools of intimidation. They want to deviate us from our purpose collectively. And we cannot allow anything, anyone, any verb, adjective, noun, pronoun get in our way. No scientific solution. We are one. So basically, we have to challenge, because once you get, once you put all this conversation together, we have some work to do. Thank you. So I agree. I think that, that we have a lot of work to do. And I think that, that one of the things that we're, I'm hoping that you all know is that you belong here. And we belong to and with you because the belonging is 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 you know a mainstay it's a it's a a, a fun foundational life need and once you belong then you belong so for me the room is better because all of you are here and the room is better because all of you are here no, and see, the problem is there are people outside of this room who don't understand that, right? And they don't feel like they belong here, but they also, they are not even seeing this kind of experience lived out, and that's what you... Well, we are live streaming, just so Well, you know. thank you. Okay, good. So at least a few people are. Um, I think that's the, that's the sad part. We've got to, I think, wake up the imaginations of people and show them 
whoa, this is actually what it can look like. Right. So that's that's the next question, of course. How do we wake up? You know, in some ways, we're we're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. Okay. So how do we how do we wake more people up? And and I believe that we have to. I believe that that that's part of the calling of people of faith, especially ministers of faith, because if we don't wake people up and if we don't move, bring God in, uh, live godly, live Goding, then how's anybody going to get this? Because if all we do is talk to ourselves, we're in trouble. So, Najuma, what do you think? So I have a little thing that I do. In it, might, it might annoy people, but I do it anyway. Um, Story of my life. <laughs> so so it's, it's, I call it my elevator kind of trick. So have you ever gotten an elevator full of people and it feels like everybody's holding their breath? <gasps> Nobody wants to talk. Don't move because we're strangers. And, oh, my God, what happens if someone says something? So I'm the person that gets in the elevator and be like, hey, what's up? Y'all all right? Everybody good? That was you? That's me oh. every day. <laughs> So it's, it's really that simple. So I, I got into an elevator yesterday. It was women. And I said, so I, I got in there. And again, that whole, don't nobody breathe, don't move. We're almost to our floor. And I said, tell the truth, ladies. How many of y'all feet hurt like mine? Because <laughs> we were at some fancy tea, and we all had on high heels. And they were like, oh, my feet hurt too. Oh, my God. But, that, but in that elevator, finding common ground. And we all connected on our feet hurting because we had been in these cute shoes that expired over an hour ago. But they all relaxed. And then we were able to talk about the event and whatever else, you know, in that, in that moment. But the point being is that's a, that's a small example or a, or a very basic example of what we can do all the time is enter into a space and don't wait for somebody else to break the ice. You break the ice. You break up that atmosphere. And find something common. If you're in the store, you know, and you see some kids acting up, you know your kids act up too. You know, go to that single mom and be like, girl, I know. You know, and then you, and you, can, you can literally see the shoulders of people relax. Because now they, they, they're connecting with someone who connects with them. So enter into spaces and find common ground with people, whether they look like you or not speak your language or not, because there's things about all of us in this room that are just common. You know, we all like to eat. We all, you know, so it's, you find that common thing, and that helps people relax, and then you can enter in to have conversation. Said I'm up. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, we got moviegoers in here? So I'm going to ask you a question real quick. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Is it even a question? See, now I know you are my people. <laughs> I just wrote a whole exactly. book about my Yeah, so now I know that we all vicariously live through the characters of superheroes, whether it's the Hulk, whether it's uh, Wolverine, Superwoman, Superwoman Miss Marvel, Captain Marvel. Captain I know that, Crunch. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, sorry, that was different. I do the exercise on the back of the box every time. So now that I know we vicariously live through these characteristics of superheroes. But the thing about vicariously living through these superheroes is that these gifts that we look at that they have, these are the same gift that God has given each of us. Amen. Oh, he did? Yeah, he did good. Yeah, it's, it's not that good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, no, I, I did. No, no. No, for me. Okay. No, go ahead. No, you're right. But my bad. No, no, it's good. The, the idea is that, yeah, the, the ordinary superheroes, that we all have these things that we've been given. So, like, I'm a Batman fan. Right, Batman is dope. True, he has no superhero. He has no superpowers, but he's strategically inclined to know how to beat everybody in the group in the Justice League. Right, so that means he's well prepared. A nice belt. He's well prepared. The utility belt, everything. So, in a sense, I came here well prepared. So when I talked to the rabbi earlier, that was me doing my Batman thing to get to know. The, I asked him, "Who is your audience?" Adam invited, and Adam invited me, and, I, and he told me that this was a community resident spot. Blew my mind. I said, man, I want to come here more often. So You're I invited. Vi you belong. So I vicariously live. I live through the little rascals. Oh, now you're talking. Now you're talking. You know what I'm saying? Okay. 
There was nobody better than Spanky. Man, man, but look, just this, this, the other night we was in a, a, a meeting at the, at the mosque. And the meeting was going into two hours, so I had a bottle wrapped with plastic. I started literally biting the plastic off the bottle and started stuffing it in the bottle, making all these noise. My little rascal was coming out. You know what I'm saying? But your gifts that you see vicariously, whether you see it in this panel, in the rabbi, in your facilitators here at the group, and Brother John here, you have that same gift. You just have to tap it yeah. and tell it to come on. Yeah, and then I told I told them all yesterday. I, I had a blog post go viral. It was on CNN. I had been fired from my church, and I said underneath me it said John Pavlovitz pastor, and it could have said unemployed and currently despondent. <laughs> but I told them that all I had were these 800 words that mattered to me, and I just put them out into the world. And there's no one in this room whose life doesn't merit that kind of. Um, impact on the world that you will have a ripple effect to your life yeah right and i think that there, here's the thing okay what i'm hearing at least we're all kind of saying the same thing we here at Beituba, we're engaged in the recovery movement in in what we're, what you're telling what all of you have said that i've heard at least the way i've heard it is we have to recover our faith in our own god God in God image, however you want to put it, okay. But the the power and the and the strength and the hope and the love will allow us to move past that fear. And I, and I think that that is something that people are missing. People live in fear all the time. What do you think, Rabbi? I I think that <laughs> again I'm going to be counterintuitive. In the Jewish faith, there's an interesting argument about when the Redeemer comes. So one theory is the Redeemer comes when we finally put an end to war, to want, to disease, to hunger. And one of the rabbis, brilliant guy in the scripture, says, well, then we wouldn't need him. And the answer is, duh. <laughs> but then there's another tradition. And, and I lived that tradition for a very long time in my life. I was a kid of the 60s, too, and once had long hair. and once had hair, so... Um, uh, let's not talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I know, I know. The, the, other, the other tradition is much less hopeful. The other tradition says, says the Redeemer comes when the apocalypse comes and there's no way to stop it. And I tell you, you know, I've been, again, reading John, and then in between reading John, you know, I turn on CNN or I read the New York Times or the Washington Post. Climate change is real. I mean, we just had a Category 5 hurricane that had the strongest recorded winds in the history of recording wind. And it's only the first of the season. And wildfires and the melting ice caps and the, the millions and millions of people who will be displaced, the, the, even domestically within a, in a country that's as prosperous as ours, that story you told is so telling. Even people who are passionately supportive of the president are beginning to see that the cracks among us are, are, are widening so wide that they might not be able to be healed. And that these, the break is, a break is coming. The, the Houthis who were supported by Iran, if I get this right, floated 10 drones and wiped out half of Saudi Arabia's oil supply. Tomorrow morning, the stock market's going to drop 1,500 points in the first five minutes, and the price of your gasoline is going to double. This is happening tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm not a prophet. I just read the New York Times. There, there, there comes a moment when all of us stop and say, this has got to stop. And, and I, I think we're getting close to that moment. I mean, that sense of the, the, the approaching apocalypse, right?